Okay. All right. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Very excited for my guest today. Dr. Christopher Kazor is here to talk with us about the new edition of his truly excellent book called The Ethics of Abortion. Really important topic, uh, especially relevant in this cultural moment as well. So Dr. Kazor, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's really great for you to have me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. So this is your first time on the show. So, I mean, some formalities are in order before we okay. start, you know, diving into the, into the weeds okay. here. If you wouldn't mind, just, uh, yeah, introduce yourself and let us know what, we, what, what made you want to become a philosopher, especially focusing on the ethics uh, of abortion and all the work that you've done. I'd love to hear some of your backstory. Well, uh, yeah, nice. So the backstory probably starts in about fourth grade. So I had two different experiences that led me to start asking some questions. And the first was that I went, uh, I was at camp and I went to, into the bathroom there and on the wall, uh, there was some graffiti, lots of graffiti, but there was a, some graffiti and it said, can God make a rock he cannot lift? Oh, interesting. I've seen a lot and, of graffiti, but not the stone paradox yet. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I, I thought this thing and I, I started thinking, I, I didn't know quite what to think. So I thought, well, okay, God is all powerful. So God can do anything. So of course he can make a rock he can't lift. But then I thought, well, if the rock is uh, something God can't lift, then the rock is sort of greater than God somehow. But God is supposed to be the greatest. He's supposed to be that that which nothing greater can be conceived. So it seems that, you know, the rock couldn't be greater than God. So God couldn't make a rock that he couldn't lift. And so I just was totally puzzled by this. And I kind of thought about it and I, I couldn't, you know, both answers seemed, seemed uh, right, you know, that God could do it, uh, but also that God couldn't do it. And both answers seemed wrong. And I just didn't know what to think. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's really the beginning of philosophy, at least according to Plato, right? Philosophy begins in wonder. And this question or this uh, little thing on the wall made me wonder about uh, about the nature of God and the limitations, if any, on God's power. And anyway, so it just got me thinking. Mm -hmm. Then the other uh, thing that got me thinking about the same age was I had, uh, I was with a fifth grader and Somehow we got started talking about uh, abortion, and he was the the sixth and youngest child in his family, and he took the pro-choice side, and for whatever reason, I took the pro-life side, and he said to me, well, look, Chris, you're trying to tell me that like one little cell, just a zygote, tiny one cell is equal to you or me? And I said, well, well, no, I don't, I don't think that. I mean, not just one cell. That, that seems kind of crazy. And he said, well, what about like two or three cells? I mean, you're telling me that's equal to you or me? And I thought, well, no, I mean, I wouldn't say two or three cells. I mean, that doesn't seem right. And he, and he goes, well, look, that's all abortion is. You just have a tiny cluster of cells and it's not equal to you or me and you're removing it. And, you know, what's wrong with that? And I thought, yeah, what is wrong with that? That, is, that seems, that seems mm -hmm. totally fine. So anyway, it kind of got me thinking. And... Um, at the same time, around the same time, a little bit later, maybe I saw uh, the Godfather uh, number two. Maybe it's the one where uh, the younger Don. What was his name? Not it's not Vito's the father, but what's the? What's the I probably one? saw the Godfather at about that age as well, and I haven't okay. seen it since. So my memory's definitely rusty on that. Okay, movie. <laughs> okay, I can't I can't remember his name now, but the main character basically. Uh -huh. And um, he is in a big fight with his wife, Kay. And Kay, oh, Michael Corleone, that was it, mm -hmm. Michael. And Kay says to Michael, um, you know that baby that I had a miscarriage of, it wasn't a miscarriage, it was an abortion. And she kind of yells this at him and you can see in his face that he's horrified and you can see in her face that she is uh, intending to really deeply wound him mm -hmm. by telling him that this was an abortion and it was a baby boy and I can't bring another uh, Corleone into this world. And and I remember that kind of made an impression on me too. I thought, wow, this mm. abortion thing must be like really serious and really uh, bad because of the way they're talking about it. So I guess in a way, you know, in these childhood experiences, there were these, um, you know, uh, puzzles and difficulties and questions. And then also a sense of that abortion's a really serious issue and a really serious topic. And yeah, I guess, uh, I guess that, you know, what would you say, accelerated really in college where I had a, uh, a roommate that was um, 
somebody who had really different views than I did. So he was uh, a kind of Protestant sometimes, and then he argued sometimes as an atheist, and he was uh, pro-choice. And we sort of debated about abortion a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were good friends. And so we didn't let you know our disagreements get in the way of our friendship. But the more I talked to him about the issue, the more I kind of became convinced that abortion really was mm. uh, seriously problematic. And so, you know, that those are sort of that you asked about the background. That's kind of, yeah. I guess, the the background of of where I'm coming from. Yeah, that's I mean, that's really interesting. And <laughs> now I'm going to have to go back and watch The Godfather. It's been so long. I don't even yeah. remember that that scene, but that's fascinating. OK, yeah. so so fast forward. And, and now you've, you've again written this excellent book. I have the second edition. I don't have the third edition yet, but for people who don't have any edition. Give us the highlights. Give us the overview. What is this book about? What can people expect uh, to find in it? And then we can start to maybe narrow in on some of the particular arguments and aspects of it, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, of course. So the the book aims to be comprehensive and to examine all the most influential, most important, and most powerful uh, defenses of the idea that abortion is morally permissible. Mm -hmm. And so I begin the book at uh, Common Ground. So everybody in the abortion debate would agree that if someone burst into your room right now and killed you, that that, that person would be doing something wrong. So clearly you and I both have a right to live. It would be wrong for someone to intentionally kill us right now. Right. And everybody agrees to that. There's no dispute about that. So you're not you're not arguing against nihilists or anti-realists or anything. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Yeah. So it is limited in the sense of, yes, of course, there are some people that would just say, look, you know, there's nothing that's right or wrong at all. Uh, you know, a kind of Sartrean person who says that all moral standards are things that we just create of our own accord. And so if you choose to create a world in which there's you know, nothing wrong with murder or rape or kidnapping, you know, 14 year olds and killing them, uh, then that's there's nothing wrong with it for you. Uh, so, yeah, I guess it is supposing uh, presupposing a kind of moral realism. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has to in a sense of, well, if you really think there's nothing at all that's wrong, I mean, even setting off a nuclear bomb and killing millions of innocent people. Well, uh, I guess, you know, we had to have to start even earlier. <laughs> right. The, the, the abortion is so downstream from that. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, yeah, no, I'm definitely presupposing. I'm presupposing things like there's an external world. Mm -hmm. Human beings exist. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm presupposing a lot, really. Yeah. But but in terms of this debate, everybody in this abortion debate that I've ever read, at least, everybody agrees it would be wrong for to kill you or me. Right. So. The question then is, well, when did you gain your right to live? So you have it right now, and presumably you had it last year, right? It would have been wrong last year for somebody to break into your office and kill you. And presumably you had it when you were 10 years old. So when did you gain it? And so the book starts by looking at the most radical view, which would be a view held by people like uh, Peter Singer and Michael Tooley and uh, and, and others that would say that your right to live began after you were born. Mm -hmm. And one prominent view is that your right to live begins when you uh, are aware that you exist and you desire to continue living. Mm -hmm. And our human awareness of our existence begins roughly around the age of two. That's when we pass the mirror test. So before that, we're a little bit like dogs and we see our image in a mirror and a dog will think it's another dog and they'll you know, attack it or play with it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But around the age of two, human beings can recognize that, oh, well, that's me in the mirror. And so they don't take it to be you know, somebody else or something else. So that's the most radical view. And then there's the view that our right to live began at birth. Mm -hmm. So I look at all the arguments in favor of the idea that the right to live begins right when we are born. Right. And then another alternative is the right to live begins sometime during gestation. And there's a whole bunch of different views there, too. So maybe it begins when we are in utero and we first begin to be conscious. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe it begins in utero when we're first viable. So that is when we can survive outside the womb with the help of technology. Maybe it begins a little bit earlier when we when sentience arises. So that would be when we're able to experience suffering and pain. Maybe it arises earlier at the point of... Uh, fetal movement, right? Or maybe at the point of felt fetal movement, quickening mm -hmm. when the mother can feel the movement or earlier before anything's felt, there's already fetal movement. Mm -hmm. Maybe it starts with the, when the brain begins to develop. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of markers. And I try to go through basically all the major uh, markers that people put forward as uh, ethically significant. Right. Uh, then still earlier would be uh, 
conception. So I look at the arguments in favor of uh, right to li life beginning right at the beginning of human life. And then I look at uh, arguments for abortion that presuppose, or at least grant for the sake of argument, the right to life of a prenatal human being. So these are arguments like that given by Judith Jarvis Thompson, the violinist argument. Mm -hmm. And then the book concludes basically with looking at uh, both artificial uteruses, artificial wombs. So if you could remove the fetus from a pregnant woman, uh, it seems like that could be a win-win. In other words, the pro-life side would be happy because the uh, prenatal human beings isn't killed. Mm -hmm. The pro-choice side, though, also would be happy because then the woman's not pregnant. She can just continue her life and doesn't have to worry mm -hmm. about pregnancy or giving birth. So it seems like arguably that could be a win-win. And I finally also look at uh, conscience protections for healthcare workers. So that's basically, yeah, it really is comprehensive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's excellent. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> so cool. much we could cover here. I actually yeah. want to start at that last thing and then we'll go back to bodily autonomy arguments and personhood arguments, all this other stuff. Sure. The artificial wound one is interesting to me because initially, right. That does sound plausible. That could be a win-win. Um, and I guess this depends on what ethical framework one is kind of carrying into the abortion debate. Um, and I guess my question for you is, where do you do you still think that it's it's a win win now? And if so, do you only think it's a temporary win? Because certainly I think I want to say now that there are there are other basic rights aside from the right to life, including the right to a mom and a dad. Right. Um, so would that just move the debate or do you think it would really stop? You see what you see what I'm saying there? Um, and, yeah. Or if it's a solution, it's a solution in sort of extraordinary circumstances. But it's not one that certainly a lot of people would say this should be like the general solution. I just wanted to get your thoughts on all that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I have to say I've grown a bit more skeptical about whether it will be a solution that's satisfactory to all sides of the debate, uh, more in terms of the pro-choice side than the pro-life side. So there has been a number of recent uh, articles that have defended the idea that even if the prenatal human being is in the artificial womb, that the parents still have a right to terminate, end the life, to kill the human being gestating in the artificial womb. So that view seems to be uh, gaining more prominence as far as I can tell. So that calls into question my earlier thesis that this would be kind of basically satisfactory to both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a skepticism on the other side though that you were talking about. Well, look, isn't this problematic to remove the human being uh, from the uh, womb of the of the woman and put it in an artificial womb, isn't this going to be depriving the child of a mother and father? I, I am l less concerned about that, that worry. And partly the reason I'm not concerned is that I really think this is just a form of early adoption. And at least for a, a lot of people, uh, adoption really is not problematic. In other words, it is something that is uh, not ideal it is something that is making the best out of a challenging, difficult situation. But at least I'm not aware of anyone who thinks that it's in principle always wrong to right, uh, I agree. Mm -hmm. maybe in a family via adoption. Like, I just don't know of anyone who thinks that. And in fact, at least for people of faith, um, you know, the church and, and other faith based groups have for centuries uh, run orphanages, uh, have facilitated adoption. And I, I myself have benefited from that. So mm -hmm. I, I am the result of a crisis pregnancy and my mother, uh, you know, gave birth to me and, and I was in, uh, you know, the care of actually nuns. This is back in the, in the late sixties. And, uh, you know, they took care of me and, and I was able to be adopted by, uh, the Kayser family. So mm -hmm. I was, you know, hugely benefited myself mm -hmm. by the care that, that people showed to uh, unwanted uh, children. So, you know, I don't see anything wrong with this. On the other hand, yes, of course, it's not wrong, but is it is it a challenge? Well, yeah, because I think it's hard for the birth mother to place a child for adoption. Uh, some people who are adopted feel very, um, you know, a sense of identity loss and confusion. I've never really felt that, but I understand other people who are adopted right. feel, like, oh, you know, who am I? you know, who, who are my real parents and, you know, stuff like that. Again, I, I never felt that uh, at all, but, but I understand other people do feel that way, but I would just say, you know, it's making the best out of a challenging situation. I mean, ideally, mm -hmm. right. You have a child who is conceived in love and raised by uh, the married parents. And, you know, they're both on board from the very beginning to love and protect and nurture this child all the way through 
the child's life. And that's, that's fantastic. That's ideal. Mm -hmm. And that's what, it, you know, I wish happened all the time, but you know, the world's not ideal and you have that's challenging right. circumstances. And I think, you know, when you have a situation like that, what is uh, called for is to try to provide the best you can right. for those who are vulnerable. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's happened. Uh, yeah. That's an excellent response and that's helpful and, and, and clarifying. And I certainly agree, like given the alternatives, right. Would much rather yeah. have the, the early adoption. I like that, that way of thinking about it rather than yeah. the intentional killing. Uh, so that's good. I just, sorry, it just popped out to me. I wanted to tease that, that out a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So let's go back now to the, to some of the more, I guess, common, um, uh, motivations uh, in in support of the permissibility of abortion, and uh, yeah, the way I see it is there's there's a, a number of um, uh, ways that uh, people who who uh, advocate for the permissibility of abortion might do it. Um, one is that they will think that that certain rights will usurp the right to life of the child, uh, say uh, bodily autonomy rights, right. something like that. Right, very very common. So I want to make sure we hit that with you. Other uh, uh, aspects um would include either i guess it's pretty rare that anyone would deny that it's a human being at conception but um less rare is people would deny it's a person and that the, right. the that the right is really grounded in personhood and, and personhood doesn't really come online until some later point right so yes uh shouldn't kill persons but it's not a problem because we don't have a person until this stage, right? So those were the two I definitely wanted to tackle with you, Dr. Kazor. Is there anyone that you'd want to address first? <laughs> Is there an order you think it best to proceed in here with this? Yeah, yeah. So let's let me talk about the personhood first and then the bodily autonomy second. So sure. with the personhood, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right that the scientific evidence is completely overwhelming that the individual in question is a living human being. And at least among philosophers, it's very rarely debated, you know, at this point. In other words, it's conceded by major um, advocates of abortion, people like uh, Peter Singer, uh, Marianne Warren, Judith Jarvis Thompson, uh, David Boonin, they all concede that basically during pregnancy, the pregnant woman is gestating a living human being. And the reason they concede this, I think, is that they're aware of the scientific evidence that this individual is, uh, first of all, living and why should we think that? Well, it's growing proportionately. It's maintaining homeostasis. Uh, this individual can die. And of course, if an individual can die, uh, that indicates the individual is alive <laughs> to start with before they die. So I think there's really no scientific evidence at all. And there's a mountain of scientific evidence in favor of the idea that this is a living individual organism. At conception but, on. Yeah, exactly. And then the second question would be, well, is this a human being? Is it a human organism? Again, I think the scientific evidence is completely overwhelming. You're talking about an individual who has a human mother and a human father, uh, who has human DNA, who has human blood, who's on a human trajectory of growth. So I think all available evidence points to the idea that this is a human individual, a human being. So then you get to the question of, well, okay, fine, it's, it's living, and it's human, but is this individual also a person? And that's a, a great deal of the burden of my book is to go through all the reasons that I am aware of why people have denied that this is a human person. Mm -hmm. And so again, some people say, well, you're not really a person until you are self-conscious. Well, there's lots of problems with that, but just one would be, well, if that's really true, then you have lots of adult human beings that are not persons. Think about mentally handicapped human beings. Some of them are not self-conscious. Some of them won't pass the mirror test. Mm -hmm. So is it really true that they're not persons and therefore they don't have basic rights? And therefore we could rape them if we wanted to, right? They're not persons, they don't have basic rights. We could kill them and take their organs and give them to someone else. Uh, that's hard to believe. That's very hard to swallow. I think for anyone who has compassion for the disabled. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's gonna work. And basically in the book, I go through all kinds of different views and I won't try to summarize them all now. Mm -hmm. But I think that the bottom line is that the various arguments given to deny personhood to the unborn, I find uh, not very sound. In addition to that, there's an argument I think that's important to consider from history. Uh, this is not the first time in which we've divided the human family into two groups, those human beings that have basic rights and those human beings that don't. And if we look back at history, every single time we've divided human beings into two groups, those that have basic rights and those that don't. 
we've made a terrible, terrible mistake. So think about slavery. We said, well, if you're a white person, you have basic rights, but if you're a person of color, you don't. Think about colonization and exploitation, where the Europeans said, well, if you're like us, if you're from Europe, you have basic rights. Well, if you're a native person, you don't. Every single time we've ever made this division in the human family, we've made a colossal mistake. Mm -hmm. And so I'm an advocate for an ethics of inclusion. Mm -hmm. I think we should include everyone. We should not exclude anyone. And part of the reason for that is every time we've ever practiced the ethics of exclusion, we've made a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think, a really good consideration. And I've appreciated that about your work. And also um, Stephen Napier, Villanova, mm -hmm. uh, um, he's got some good, it's sort of, I kind of think of it as like a, as a sort of Pascal's wager in a different context, right? If you're, right. if you're agnostic on the abortion issue, um, which way should you sort of, sort of lean? If like, you've looked at the, the philosophical debates and you just can't make up your mind, right? Just from an issue of safety, I guess. Right. Which way should you lean? Do you think that's a, a fair way of, of framing the position you're trying to, to put forward? Because yeah. we've been so wrong so many times. Yeah, so, um, mm -hmm. I think that's right. And and when I've talked to defenders of abortion, like sometimes I'll ask them, I'll say, okay, well, let's put aside abortion for a minute. Are there any other cases in history where we've said of one class of human beings, you are a sub person, you don't count. Is there any other case in history where we've made that distinction and said, oh yeah, that was a great idea. Totally on board with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there isn't any, right? I mean, think of, here's another example. And sometimes in places we've said, well, look, if you're my religion, well, then you have basic rights and you count and you have protection of the laws. If you're a different religion from me, you don't count. And mm -hmm. we can imprison you, kill you, do whatever we want to. Again, when we look back at that, we're horrified. We think that's terrible. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, we're doing a similar thing. We're saying, well, if you're like me, if you're born, well, then you have basic rights and privileges and you shouldn't be killed. But if you're not like me, if you're a different kind of human being, well, then you're second class and you don't count. So mm -hmm. I just think it's quite obvious when we think about it, that every single time we've ever done this, it has uh, been a catastrophe. Yeah, that's that's really good. Now, I want to be clear, that doesn't end the debate, but I think it's a strong, important sort of background consideration, if, if nothing else, right? Especially mm -hmm. for people who might who might be somewhat agnostic on the issue. Right. Now, I want to come back to the to the personhood thing, because you make a, a generally good point that I think is kind of like the master consideration, is that when it seems, um, uh, when it comes to a lot of these, these say, uh, personhood arguments, right, where they're trying to ground the permissibility of abortion, they suffer from arbitrariness in, in two respects. Arbitrariness of like when the person emerges or super beans or, or whatever, and uh, a matter of degree, right? Because yeah. what right. their marker is something that is itself susceptible to being degreed. Uh, so maybe you want to just articulate uh, those and expand upon those points, because I think it's a it's really important sure. consideration. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to use one example, Marianne Warren talks about five different things that distinguish a mere human being on the one hand from a person on the other. Mm -hmm. And one of those is the ability to communicate. And this seems uh, a arbitrary in the sense of, well, why the ability to communicate, right? There's many different things human beings do and the ability to communicate just sort of chosen uh, seemingly at random mm -hmm. uh, over things like self-awareness over other kind of, kinds of characteristics. But then we talk about arbitrariness also in terms of the degree so, you know, birds communicate to a degree, right? They mm -hmm. chirp back and forth. Dogs communicate to a degree. They bark when the, someone knocks on the door they don't know. And human beings obviously communicate on a wide range, uh, a, wide, a wide spectrum, you might say. So there's very primitive kinds of forms of communication that, that newborn babies can do. There's a toddler that can kind of babble and say a few words. Was well, that enough? Uh, there's, you know, much more sophisticated communication that a kindergartner would do. But if you compare a kindergartner with a Harvard professor, well, the Harvard professor can communicate, you know, a lot more uh, in a lot more sophisticated way than the, the kindergarten can. So basically what you're doing is you're taking a randomly chosen characteristic mm -hmm. and then a random degree of that characteristic. Right. Well, you have to. And Warren's way of putting it is for her, you have to communicate an indefinite variety of messages about an indefinite variety of topics. Okay, well, why? why? Why is that the standard? And the same thing could be said of many other things like self-awareness. Self-awareness comes on a continuum also, right? Think about when you wake up in the morning, 
right? And you're kind of groggy and half asleep. You might say, well, you're kind of half self-aware. Mm -hmm. right? So imagine, say, the perfectly self-aware person's at 100%. And maybe when you wake up, you know, you're at 30%. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why is 30% the standard, not 28%? Right. Mm -hmm. Why not 32%? It's completely random and arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, we have to have random and arbitrary rules. Think about in the United States, you know, you can get a driver's license at 16. And well, why not 15 and a half? Why not 17? It's kind of random and arbitrary. Well, yeah, that's true. But that kind of right is different than the right to live, right? Mm -hmm. With the right to drive, that comes along with responsibilities. In other words, we can't allow people to drive unless they're old enough to have a responsibility to drive in a safe way on the road and not kill other people. Mm -hmm. but the right to life is something different. A right to life can be had by a newborn baby or by a handicapped person just lying in a bed. And because the right to live doesn't come with responsibilities that you have to discharge certain things like not run your car off the road. So we can tolerate and it makes sense to say, look, some rights like the right to drive or the right to vote come along with responsibilities and we have to assess, look in a typical uh, human development, when are you mature enough to drive a car safely? When are you mature enough to understand what voting is and you know, evaluate candidates and make a vote? And it makes sense, I think, to say, well, look, 18, that sounds about right for voting. You know, Let's say three years old, clearly you're not old enough to understand even when an election is really, so it's too young. You know, 16 for driving, not four years old for driving. Mm -hmm. so, that makes sense that there can be a certain range of, you know, look, you're generally mature enough to drive a car at this age. And it can be, you know, maybe in some countries, 18, maybe in some countries, 15. But the right to live is totally different. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really important point about because um, we've been talking about basic rights, but there's other rights yeah. that we think sort of uh, can be limited. Right. And, and, and in fact, uh, people can fail to even attain that right because they don't they actually don't perform to a certain level. But exactly. basic rights, we're saying, aren't dependent upon performance. And I think that's part of the, it really maybe perhaps the issue, right? Do you, do you have these basic rights in virtue of what you can do or in virtue of what you, what you are, right? And exactly. I, think, I think the pro-life position wants to say in virtue of what you are, exactly. right? Rather in virtue of, of what you can do, right? That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Because if we are going to have a functional view of personhood where your basic rights depend on how well you function, I don't see any way in which we can secure the basic rights of handicapped people mm -hmm. because some mentally handicapped people, some intellectually disabled people uh, do not function very well. And I think it's, it's obvious and really monstrous to think that some poor, disabled, intellectually handicapped person has no basic rights and therefore it's perfectly fine to rape them, to murder them, to take their organs, to give to somebody else. I mean, uh, that's the kind of thing that I think any decent person can see is un completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And so if we reject this idea of a functional view of a person, well, that should apply not only to mentally handicapped adults, but also to uh, young human beings, babies, yeah. and those in utero. Right. And um, yeah, maybe we could even talk about intuition a bit, because even though I don't think intuitions are infallible, I think they're, they're sort of important um, for, for moral reasoning. And same thing with the desire thing. It seems like our desires can come in degrees. I mean, God bless anybody who struggled with depression, but there's oftentimes when I think it's right to say people do not desire That's right. uh, to live anymore. And I think what we want to say to that person is, no, you haven't lost your right just because you're depressed. And it would be as wrong to kill you or murder you now, even if you aren't desiring to continue on as anybody else. Maybe you want to just comment on that a little bit as well. It seems just another instance of this arbitrariness degreed problem, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're totally right. Our right to live uh, can't be based simply on our desires, mm -hmm. at least if we're going to have equal rights to live. Mm -hmm. Your desires are, even an individual's desires, are shifting over time. So how much do you want to stay alive? Well, you know, for me, that's going to vary, right? Sometimes I, uh, you know, eat healthy and I avoid dangerous activities and I do, you know, lots of things to extend my life. Uh, at other times, I've not eaten healthy and, and done, you know, driven too fast or whatever. So, you know, even within a, an individual person, their desire to continue living is not a fixed thing, right? Mm -hmm. It can be greater. It can be lesser. You might have something in your life that dampens your desire to continue living. Maybe you get sick and you feel like, oh, gosh, I just want it to be over. Or maybe you have a terrible life event happen to you and you just think, oh, gosh, I'm just so sick of life. I want to get out of here. Mm -hmm. Or the reverse. Maybe something fantastic happens to you. And your desire to continue living increases radically. 
-hmm. Well, it's kind of bizarre to think that your right to life is just going up and down. And some days you have a really strong right to life because you really desire to live. And other days your right to life is kind of weak because you're you know depressed and just don't mm -hmm. feel like it. Uh, and this range also applies uh, when you compare different people. So you and I, do we have an equal right to live or equal desire to live rather? I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt any of our desires are exactly equal, mm -hmm. right? If you put us both on a desert island, maybe you would give up hope before I would. Maybe mm -hmm. I would give up hope before you would just be like, I'm fine. I'm, I just can't take it. I'm just going to die. Mm -hmm. You know, but we, you and I have equal rights to live. Mm -hmm. right? so our rights to live just aren't dependent on our uh, desires, which shift day to day and obviously are not equal from person to person. Right. Yeah. So big takeaway here is there's these issues of, of arbitrariness um, in, in different respects, both of what, what is the actual criteria and a matter of, of degree. And of course, people can go much more detail in your book, which 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 I hope that they do. So is there anything else you want to say about personhood arguments in general um, before we move on to yeah, some of the other one, considerations? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. Um, I don't think the discussion of abortion really depends on personhood. In other words, I think you can have a, an argument against abortion that has nothing to do with personhood. Mm -hmm. so let me let me describe that. And this is not uh, an, an argument that's original with me. This was first put forward by a philosopher named Dom, Don uh, Marcus, and he's an atheist. So this argument has nothing to do with faith or religion or yeah. you know theology. And here's his argument. And, and also this argument has nothing to do with personhood. So why is it wrong for someone to kill you or me right now. Well, if someone burst into the room and killed you or me right now, that person couldn't take away our past, right? We still have the good things that happened to us yesterday and last week and last year. But what the person would deprive us of is our futures. In other words, if you get killed today, or I do, I'm not gonna be able to make new friends later. I'm not gonna be able to learn new things. I'm not gonna be able to love the people that I love. All these things that I would have done if I hadn't gotten killed are, I, are all taken away from me. Mm -hmm. So what happens, in other words, if someone kills us today is that they take away our chance for a valuable future. And so the same thing is true if you kill a newborn baby. If you kill a newborn baby, you take away her chance to make friends and go to kindergarten and, you know, learn to ride a bike and play the violin and all the things she would have enjoyed. You deprive she's deprived of all those things because you killed her. The same thing is true of killing that same child. Uh, you know, six months earlier when she was in utero. If she gets killed there, she's de she's deprived of her chance for a valuable future. So the very same reason that it's wrong to kill you or me now is the same reason it's wrong to kill a newborn baby and is the same reason it's wrong to kill a prenatal human being. Mm -hmm. And so you note that this argument I just made does not mention personhood. It doesn't depend on, you know, is personhood this or is personhood that. It's neutral with respect to personhood. Yeah. So you can have that view and you could think all prenatal human beings are persons. Mm -hmm. You could have the view and think that no prenatal human beings are persons. It's just independent of that altogether. Right. So I love the So that argument is really interesting because obviously there's a lot of people who disagree with it, but there's not a lot of like consensus on how they disagree with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like they they're yeah. kind of like, there's got to be something wrong with this if they're uh, trying to defend a pro-choice view, but there's uh, different ways that they, they come at it. I'd be curious how you respond to, the threat that that might open up issues on the other end, that maybe it would be less of an offense to kill somebody who's much older rather than than much younger. Do you think that that, that argument has other problematic potential implications? Well, I think in a certain sense that is true. In mm -hmm. other words, every murder and every unlawful killing, every homicide is different circumstantially. Mm -hmm. so for instance, um, if you kill a mother who has uh, four young children, uh, that murder is in some respects worse right. than killing uh, a man of the same age who has no children, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Killing somebody who is uh, having a fantastic life, who has lots of friends, who's making huge contributions to the community, who's just having a great life, is in that respect worse than killing a homeless person who is suicidal and is just suffering and is having a horrible life. So whenever we compare homicides, there's going to be circumstantial aspects of those homicides, which makes which make them better or worse in some respect. Mm -hmm. um, if you kill a president or a prime minister or a pope, that's worse in some respects than killing a regular person like you or me. Why? 
Because if you kill a president, prime minister, or pope, that can be a world-shaping event that can mm-hmm. maybe cause a world war. Who knows? It can it can cause very serious issues. Whereas if someone kills you or me, you know, it's not going to launch World War Three. I mean, it's bad. Might, it might upset a couple podcast listeners, but well, yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. Okay, so maybe, <laughs> but you get the idea. You I, get of it. course, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Uh-huh. So in some respect, when you're comparing homicides, there's going to be circumstantial differences that make uh, a homicide worse than a, another. Mm-hmm. So I would say one factor, not the only factor, is age. Mm-hmm. Right. In other words, if someone kills me today, I, that's really too bad for me. But at least I've lived half my life. Mm-hmm. If someone kills uh, my 17 year old daughter, that's worse. She's at, at the very beginning of her life. And so she's losing more. Yeah. Um. So but that's not the only relevant uh, circumstance. So basically, I would just say that that the argument of depriving an individual of a chance for a valuable future is um, is compatible with the idea that um, there's in another respect, an equal wrongness of all killing of innocent human beings. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's good. And actually, I want to tie that into one of the, the famous uh, thought experiments that's often used against the pro-choice. Buildings on fire, you can save yeah. either, you know, the three-year-old or the uh, frozen uh, embryo. So maybe you could tie that all together for us. Sure, and, yeah. sure. So, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah. When you're thinking about saving um, individuals, there's a lot of different factors that are relevant for who you save. Mm-hmm. So if you have, um, yeah, the Titanic is sinking and the lifeboat only has so many places, you know, who would I put in the lifeboat? Well, if my family were with me, I'd probably give precedence to my own children, mm-hmm. right? Why? Well, I have a special responsibility for them, a special obligation to them. And so I almost surely would try to ensure that my own kids got in the lifeboat. So let's say my kids aren't there. Who would I give precedence to? Well, there is that old adage of women and children first. So, it, you know, if you went by that, you'd say, look, the women and children should get on the lifeboat first and the guys, sorry, you're going to have to stay there. Um, what's another principle you could use? Well, you could use the principle of, in general, uh, people that are younger have precedence over people that are older. So if I can put, you know, 10 children onto the lifeboat rather than 10 90-year-olds, well, I would do that. Now, none of that is to is to call into question the basic rights of the people that you don't choose to save. Mm-hmm. If I put 10 you know, kids on the lifeboat rather than 10 90-year-olds, I'm not saying, oh, 90-year-olds don't have a right to live. Or if I put my own kids in front of somebody else's kids, I'm not saying those other kids don't have a right to live. There's all kinds of circumstantial factors that are relevant for saving individuals, including their roles in the community. So if you have the choice between saving a president, prime minister, or a pope, on the one hand, or saving a plain person, on the other hand, I think it would make sense to save the leader of the community because that person's death has very negative ramifications, uh, much more significant generally than the death of a plain person. So none of that, again, is to call into question the basic rights of the people that you don't save. So how do you handle the case of you're saving a five-year-old child, let's say on the one hand, or frozen embryos on the other hand? Well, what I'd say is, the, uh, there's a number of relevant factors here that that tilt uh, favor in tilt the scales in favor of cha- saving the five year old child. So one of them is the likelihood of continued life. So the fact is that about half of frozen embryos don't even survive getting unfrozen. Then you have the problem of getting finding someone to be implanted in. Okay, well many many embryos never are implanted in anyone, and then you have the problem even if they're the thawing works right, even if you find someone to implant, that many uh, of those embryos end up miscarrying. They have a very high rate of miscarriage. So the bottom line is that when you have a five-year-old child, the likelihood of that child continuing life is extremely high. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it would be like, uh, you know, you've got someone who has all kinds of cancer and you save that person, or you've got a perfectly healthy person, right? If if those were the only things you knew, seems to me you try to save the perfectly healthy person because the person with cancer already is in danger of dying from you know their cancer. Mm-hmm. So the frozen embryos are already in danger of dying from the things I just mentioned. So I don't think it's a problem at all to say that you'd rescue you know this group of people rather than that group of people. That's perfectly compatible with saying that all human beings have basic rights. Right. And that's such an important point is that there can be other considerations that can that can cause you to make one particular moral decision a tough one granted right a a tough Mm -hmm. one of of who to save 
but it is it's sort of a howling non sequitur if i may speak forthrightly yeah. i think that that would that would lead you to think that the person who didn't save doesn't have a basic right to life exactly well, mm -hmm. yeah really good okay so if you don't mind then uh, unless there's anything else you want to say about those general considerations i like that you put out that is it i was is it don marquis or or marquis i've never known the i, I think <laughs> it, i think it's uh Marcus. Marcus. It. Okay. So I, I pronounced it, yeah. it doubly wrong then. That's good. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe we could turn to the bodily autonomy types of arguments. So this, you know, maybe the consideration now is, yeah, we're not denying even personhood or that there, there might be rights uh, here, but there's, there's other rights that now take priority, right? That, that, yeah. that, um, yeah. So maybe you can outline some of the, some of the famous considerations there, violinist arguments and how you like to, to address those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the most famous, uh, argument in favor of that view that you just mentioned is called the violinist argument put forward by Judith Jarvis Thompson in the early seventies. And it goes like this. Imagine you wake up and you are in the hospital and you find yourself attached to a child uh, who's this famous violinist. Mm -hmm. And let's say she's 10 years old and she's you know totally a person as much as you or me. And it would be very nice, according to this argument, for you to stay connected to her. But if you disconnect yourself from the violinist and the violinist dies of her own underlying health problems, you haven't done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So you'd be a good Samaritan to remain attached to the violinist, but you're not doing anything wrong if you detach yourself from the violinist. Now, this argument has been examined extensively for years and years and years, and it there's many, many different arguments for and against it. And of course, we don't have time to go over uh, all those arguments. But in my book, I do try to cover basically all the major, uh, you know, arguments given in favor of this violinist analogy and and the critiques of them. Mm -hmm. Let me just talk about a couple. Sure. One is that there's a huge difference between uh, providing aid to the violinist on the one hand, and when you detach from the violinist, when you cut the cords and the violinist dies of, of her own underlying maladies, there's a huge difference between that and actually what takes place in abortion. Mm -hmm. So if we were to set the analogy straight, it wouldn't be that I detach myself from the violinist and the violinist dies of her own underlying health malady. It would rather be that there's actions done to the body of the violinist that uh, violent actions that end up intentionally killing the violinist. Well, that seems like a very different situation than just a gentle detaching from the violinist and the violinist dies of her own underlying maladies. In other words, there's a huge difference between intentionally killing mm -hmm. what takes place in abortion versus on the other hand, failing to save, mm -hmm. right? Not providing aid to someone. Those are just to totally different things. A second big difference is that I believe that parents have very serious responsibilities for their own biological children. So if I um, go out tonight to some bar and uh, you know get a get a woman pregnant, even if I use contraception, well, I still am responsible for paying child support payments for 18 years. And moreover, even beyond legal responsibility, I think, that I have a very serious moral responsibility to try to provide for my own daughter, you know, given that I caused her to come into existence. Mm -hmm. And we tend to think that parents do have these serious obligations to support a, their own biological children. And so uh, that's true of a biological father, that's true of a biological mother. Mm -hmm. So the in, the in the situation of pregnancy, Right, you have a uh, biological mother who has serious responsibilities for her own biological child to provide aid for that child, and that would be true whether or not the child was chosen or wanted. So mm -hmm. let me use a different analogy to try to make that clear. Yeah, let's say you have um, Jeff and Christy, and they're dating on and off. They're kind of uh, you, you know they see each other only in the summers, let's say, and then um, Christy calls up. Uh, Jeff and says, hey, I want to let you know, um, uh, I want to get together with you. Why don't you come up to the cabin? And so, you know, goes up to the cabin and she says, you know, I haven't seen you in uh, a year and a half, but I just want to let you know uh, you're a father. Uh, you know, our newborn daughter, daughter Emma is in the other room and, and you know, that let's say the guy's not very happy about this. They get in a big fight. And then um, uh, Christy leaves, right? And leaves this guy with his daughter, Emma. And let's say there's a big uh, uh, 
mudslide and the, the mountain road is taken out. And so he's stuck there with his daughter. Mm. Now, I think it's very clear that he has a responsibility to take care of his infant daughter, that he has to use his body to support her. Mm. And mm. If he fails to do that if they clear out the road eventually and get up there. And then the, um, you know, the medics say, well, what happened to this baby, Emma? And he goes, well, look, I didn't want to use my body to support her and to help her. So I just didn't, you know, I just played video games and drank beer and yeah, she died, uh, you know, from not being fed and, hmm. you know, sorry, I, I have a right to control my own body and I have no obligation to use my body to support her. So I didn't. Well, that's absurd, right? I mean, no one right. thinks you have, you have a duty as a parent, even if you didn't choose this, even if you as a surprise pregnancy or whatever, you have a duty to take care of your own son or daughter. And hmm. so I think the violinist analogy in the end, uh, doesn't really work. Yeah, you know, it seems like it's it's really only relevant in hard cases, which I want to uh, talk to you about here in a minute. Uh, one thing I like about your project is you is you do approach it from. It's not completely metaphysically neutral, of course, but there's a, a general metaphysical neutrality, and I guess I want to get your your thoughts on that because, what do you think the pros and cons of that are? Because, for example, if if you come to this debate, say with maybe a broadly Aristotelian framework. Then you mm -hmm. have natural dispositions yeah. available. And then there's like all sorts of relevant differences between a pregnancy and this violinist that I think help That's to great. shine a lot of moral clarity on that. But then you have to sort of defend those more contra now all metaphysics is controversial. Right. Um, right. So you see, you see the point I'm trying to make. Maybe you just want to play on that a little bit. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So in the book, what I've tried to do is you're right. Maintain as much as I can uh, kind of metaphysical neutrality, and and also actually as much as I can, a kind of ethical neutrality in the sense that I don't really in the book come down on, look, ultimately, should we have a Kantian framework? Ultimately, should we have an Aristotelian framework, a natural law framework, consequentialist framework? I don't really get into those issues. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have to presuppose, obviously, lots of things, but what I try to do is approach it with what you might call a common morality. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking here of someone like Alan Donegan, who kind of have this idea of kind of a common morality. In other words, the Kantian, the Rawlsian, the consequentialist, almost all ethical views can sign on to what you might call common morality. For instance, uh, if someone were to kill you right now, all those views would agree it's wrong. Now, ultimately, they'd have different ways of trying to cash that out and say, well, why is it wrong to kill you? Well, if you're a utilitarian, you'd say, well, killing you undermines the greatest happiness for the greatest number. I need to explain that in terms of, well, killing you deprives you of the future happiness you'd have. Killing you would make your friends and your family very upset. Killing you might strike terror into the podcasting community where podcasters would be worried about, you know, getting killed. And so their happiness is put down. So you could have this kind of meta ethical view about, you know, what ultimately justifies the norm against killing innocent human beings. Uh, you could have a Kantian justification for that. You could have an Aristotelian justification for that. You could have a natural law justification for that. Now, in my book, I'm trying not to take sides in that broader ethical debate. I have my own views, of course, but I'm trying not to invoke those things insofar as I can, because uh, I think in a way I'm trying to write a I'm trying to talk about the ethics of abortion. And if I also have to talk about, well, look, is Kant right? Is Aristotle right? Is Mill right? Is Rawls? I, you know, that's just taking you too far afield. I mean, yeah. there's enough to talk about with the ethics of abortion. If I try to adjudicate among all these rival theories of metaphysics or of ethics, well, you know, you can see that's going to be multi-volume going on forever. So, so I'm trying to limit it to, as far as I can, things that are more or less acceptable to hopefully broad numbers of people that may have different views ultimately about metaphysics or about ethics. Right. Yeah. And I think strategically that is, that is very wise. I'd just be curious if you think that there's um, maybe special advantages that a certain framework, whether it's natural law or, or virtue ethics um, offer to say, re to, to responding to some of these types of argu arguments. So I've always been attracted to natural law because I think at the end of the day, it makes the best sense of our best moral intuitions. Yeah. Um, and I think, we have to rely on more intuitions to some level. Everyone with common morality does, right? Yeah. But sometimes those intuitions might get overridden by the deeper meta ethics, right? So maybe the consequentialists right. will, will, okay, that intuition's off and maybe we could justify this. So I just yeah. wonder like how, how, how long can you stay 
in that realm of common morality or um yeah i don't know exactly what my question is there i'm just trying to <laughs> trying to yeah trying to ferret something out you know <laughs> well i do think there's uh something to this idea of a reflective equilibrium right that you're yeah. going to you're going to have intuitions and you're going to have your theory. And there's a kind of back and forth that goes on, right? Where you say, well, my intuition about this is such and such. Then the theory I have is this other thing. And and as you draw new cases and get deeper insights into your, your theory, there's going to be a kind of adjustment that goes on, presumably. So, yeah, so that that's my way of thinking about it. I mean, my own personal views, I don't think are... Um, I guess one way to think of it is I don't think I needed in this book to bring in all the things I think about all these kinds of issues. I mean, sure. I obviously like everybody, I have views about all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I have views about which, you know, martial art is the best martial art. I've used about jiu obviously. Was, I mean, yeah, that's true, actually. Right. Yeah, that's true. Do you do jujitsu? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Bat more, my too. more formal background is Taekwondo, but more recently. Jiu -jitsu. I do too. Yeah. Uh -huh. All yeah. right. Yeah. I know you do. I so, see so you train with, with, uh, the Gracie's, right? Um, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I go to Hoist Gracie's uh, place. It's yeah. Really I, saw, cool. I saw you put up a photo not too long ago. I'm like, That's really cool. Really? I want to like make, make sure we talk about that. So here we are. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's for sure. But, yeah. you know, obviously, I don't need to talk about all my views about everything in this book. But yes, is it true that, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. What I tried to do in this book is, insofar as I was able not to take stands on controversial metaphysical and broadly, you know, uh, I'm calling it meta ethical, but it's not really meta ethical, but you know what I mean? Yep. You know, which of the big views is correct. I tried to the most, as far as I could not to take strong stands on those. Yeah. Now, I do think in various parts in the book, it's implicit. Um, but you know, okay. It's implicit in various parts of the book, but I tried not to invoke that insofar yeah. as I could. Yeah. And I think you did a great job and it's something cool. I admired about your project. And I just was just curious. I've been being self-indulgent here, actually. So <laughs> we can move yeah. on to an, on to another one. Uh, we actually have a lot of uh, questions and comments I'd love to get to, Dr. Kazor. But is there anything else so far um, that we haven't covered that, that you would want? Oh, the, the hard cases, of course. Right. We should we should we should um, focus on those. So cases of rape and incest. What do you think is, is the right way to think through these? obviously very difficult uh, cases, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the first thing for me at least is to focus on uh, compassion and care mm -hmm. because I do think that anyone who's been sexually assaulted and has gone through a catastrophically, unbelievably challenging, difficult, horrifying uh, situation. And so, you know, I think the law should be very firm and strict in terms of punishing everyone who does those sorts of acts. And I think we really do need to reach out with special compassion to women that are in that kind of situation. I mean, my view is that all women with crisis pregnancies deserve support and compassion and help, uh, just as my mother received. I mean, my birth mother got the help she needed and was very supported and, and that's the way it should be. And I think all women deserve that kind of support and that kind of help. I also think that just as we should punish the perpetrators of this evil, I don't think it's fair to punish someone else for uh, the evil that they did not do. Mm -hmm. So if I punch you in the face, I, that's totally wrong. And you should you know, maybe punch me back in the face, call the cops. But if I punch you in the face and then you turn around and punch your little sister in the face, well, that, that's, not, that's not okay. That's not a, a proper response. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a time machine. And we cannot go back in time and undo a rape. Mm -hmm. But I think a woman who carries a crisis pregnancy to term, especially one conceived in that way, is in fact acting in an direct, uh, a way directly contradictory to what the rapist did. So what does a rapist do? He uses violence to harm someone. But what does the woman who gives life in this situation, in this situation, what does she do? Well, she's taking a path of nonviolence, not to harm someone but to really help someone, mm -hmm. right? The rapist does what? The rapist takes away someone's freedom. But the woman who gives life in this situation does just the opposite of that. She's giving someone freedom. The rapist does something incredibly selfish and horrible. And what does a woman do in this situation? She does something incredibly generous and helpful. So, you know, nothing undoes a rape, but a woman who moves forward giving life in this situation is really acting in the exact opposite way of what the rapist did. And so I find that heroic. I find that beautiful. 
And it is really heroic and, and that makes it an unbelievable challenge. And I, unfortunately though, I do think it can happen where a person is left really with only two options, either to be a hero or to do something bad. And this happens often when evil people intervene. Mm -hmm. Think about World War II, right? Hitler and the Nazis put many people in a situation where they were forced either to go along with evil and do something bad or to be a hero, even at the cost of self-sacrifice. So evil people can put us in a situation where the kind of morally uh, permissible but everyday ordinary thing just isn't available any longer, mm -hmm. right? They're forced really to choose between real, real heroism or to do something uh, that's wrong. And so I would say that the circumstances of our conception don't change at all our basic moral worth. So I was conceived, as I mentioned before, uh, through sex outside of marriage. Other people were conceived through rape or incest. Other people were conceived in a very beautiful way, right? Where their parents are married and it's their you know, fifth wedding anniversary and then they're Ritz Carlton and there's roses around the bed and everything beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. But all of us, however we were conceived, have equal basic moral worth. Mm -hmm. And so we can't say, well, if you were conceived in a beautiful way, you have a strong right to life. If you're conceived in, a, in an ugly way, you have a weak right to life or no right to life. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't really make sense. So, you know, rape is obviously a very, very difficult situation. And uh, as I said, I think that we need to do everything we can, both in law and in culture, to encourage uh, respect for women and to discourage and punish with the full force of the law anyone who does those sorts of despicable acts. But I don't think at the end of the day that the case of rape actually justifies the right. taking of a life of a prenatal human being. Yeah, and of course I, I agree with that, but I really appreciate the way you articulate it. Um, really just just very beautifully well stated, very compassionate response. I think that's so important in this debate. And I want to make it clear, you know, I'm I'm obviously on the on the pro-life uh, position, but one thing that I've always appreciated about you, Dr. Kazor, is the charity you bring to this debate, along with the logical clarity. And that we can recognize, despite our, our deep disagreement, uh, that a lot of people are motivated to the pro-choice position because of well, motivations that um, are by themselves quite respectable and and and, and quite admirable, uh, and I think that's I think that's worth trying to find that that common ground and establishing that common ground before we sort of get into what can otherwise be a, a, a understandably very heated debate. And maybe you just want to say a few words just about just the the manner of the debate, not apart from the matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I mentioned earlier in the podcast how I. Had the, I've had the most discussions about this issue with uh, uh, my uh, college roommate, Chad. So we lived next door to each other for one year and then lived together for two different years. And uh, he was the best man in my wedding. I was the best man in his wedding. And the fact that we had different views about this issue uh, was uh, not an occasion for uh, calling into question his intelligence or his sincerity. I think that people who defend abortion uh, for the most part, are motivated by the desire to help other people. And I, I totally respect that. And I want to help other people too. Um, so I think we do have definite common ground on that. And I don't think that our disagreements need to call cause us to call into question the goodwill uh, of these people that we don't yet see eye to eye with. So I think that... Um, you know, moving forward, it's important to recognize recognize the reality, right? That that sometimes people do see things very differently, and it's easy to paint people that with whom we disagree as uh, moral monsters, and they're terrible. And I don't think that's really true. I, I I don't think that's true of people on the pro life side or the pro choice side. I think there are some bad people on both sides. There's bad people in every group uh, around, right? So I think that's true. And there's kind of crazy people in every group around. I mean, look at, you know, literally any group. Think of doctors. Like in general, I have a huge respect for doctors. I think they're helping people. They're they're really smart. They're doing all kinds of things. But do you find bad doctors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you find even crazy doctors? You do. People that, doctors that are terrible people. Yeah, mm -hmm. fair enough. So uh, I guess... For me, at least, I try to operate with the principle of uh, giving people the benefit of the doubt and trying as far as I can to look for what's good and true and honorable about uh, other people. And mm -hmm. yes, are, are there imperfections there? Yes, of course. There's imperfections in everybody walking on planet Earth. 
So we're all imperfect. We're all flawed. We all have weaknesses and blind spots. But I do think if you're talking with somebody, it's very hard to make any progress. And it's very hard, frankly, to learn from anyone if you're just presupposing, oh, this is the devil incarnate. This person's, you know, Hitler mm -hmm. number two. Uh, I think that's quite unfair, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Really good reminders. Thank you. So one more thing I want to cover and then we'll head to a few questions. In fact, I saw this already came up in the comments and it is sort of culturally relevant right now with the overturning of Roe. We've we've heard that um, I think a, a lot of conflation between abortion and the treatment of ectopic pregnancies and other yeah. things like that. So, you know, you know what I'm talking about, but I, if you'd like to articulate what you think these uh, the distinctions are and, and maybe try and clear up some misunderstandings around all this. Sure, so, sure. So uh, I've written a lot about ectopic pregnancies. I think I've written two or three scholarly articles. So mm -hmm. I'll be happy to, if you want to email me, you can put them on, you know, the website or whatever people can. Yeah, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. But um, basically an ect ectopic pregnancy is a preg pregnancy outside of the uterus. So mm -hmm. typically, not always, but typically an uh, ectopic pregnancy is where the embryo implants in the fallopian tube. And if this happens, it is morally permissible. It is not direct abortion. It's not intentionally killing the human being in utero to remove the ectopic pregnancy. So this can be done, for instance, one way is you remove the section of the fallopian tube in which the embryo has unfortunately uh, implanted. Now, this is not, as I say, to repeat, not intentional killing. Now, why do I say that? Well, for a number of reasons, but the most obvious is this. In most cases of ectopic pregnancy, the prenatal human being has already died. So what happens in most 80% of ectopic pregnancies is the embryo is, is dead, is no longer there. And what's happening is the trophoblast, the forerunner of the placenta, continues to grow and develop. So removing an ectopic pregnancy, either the whole tube or just the section where the dead embryo is, uh, is not intentional killing. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because in 80% of the cases, the embryo is already dead. You can't mm -hmm. kill someone who's already dead. Mm -hmm. So the, it's really a red herring, and all abortion laws in the United States already recognize that treatments of ectopic pregnancy in no way are a violation of a norm against intentional killing. Mm -hmm. So I know people talk about this, but the people who say that really don't know the law, and they certainly don't know the ethics of treating ectopic pregnancies. Yeah, well, thank you for for stating that because I've I've seen that going around, <laughs> as I'm yeah. sure I'm sure you have uh, as well. It's and it's it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. So, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Kays, or maybe we could spend a couple minutes taking some questions from the audience sure. here. There's some good stuff that is that has come in. This one from Adrian uh, uh, Torres says, uh, "Where do you think the arguments advanced by David Boonin?" and other uh, abortion advocates uh, go wrong. So I know you engage with uh, Putin uh, in, in your book. Maybe you want to just uh, give some highlights here. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. David Boonin is, I think, a really good philosopher. And his uh, arguments uh, about abortion are quite influential. So I do spend a lot of time in the book talking about David Boonin. He might be the person I cite most in the book. Uh, in any case, his view of when we gain a right to life is this. He thinks we gain a right to life around 25 to 32 weeks in uh, gestation. And he says that's the point at which we first begin to have self-awareness, self-consciousness, and therefore we can first have desires for anything, including implicitly a desire to continue living. So I say implicitly because we don't explicitly in utero think, oh, I want to continue living, but we could have a desire, for instance, to hear our mother's voice, and then we can only do that if we're alive, so we implicitly have this desire to live. Mm -hmm. um, so Boonin's view, though, I think really doesn't work very well at all. Uh, and there are a number of reasons. One we've already talked about. His view seems to presuppose that our rights uh, are grounded in our desires. And I think that's totally false. We mm -hmm. have rights independently of our desires. Uh, and we've talked about this already. A second problem for Boonin's view, though, is that his view ends up justifying infanticide. So in the United States, there are many, many children that are born uh, before 25 to 32 weeks. There are many prematurely born children. Now, if his view were right, we'd have to say that a child born, let's say at 24 weeks, does not have a right to live. Mm -hmm. And there would be nothing wrong, therefore, with the parents killing that newborn baby. But Boonin himself is, uh, seems to reject infanticide. So even on his own grounds, on grounds of his own view, we should reject that. But 
but certainly if you reject infanticide, you should reject uh, Boonin's view of personhood. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. no, yeah. I'm sorry, did you want to add something the else there? Thing is mm -hmm. Boonin uh, famously talks about a case called uh, Schimpf mm -hmm. in which one cousin sued another cousin to force that cousin to donate a kidney to him. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, this is like abortion, right? Where you have someone in need of help, the fetus, and the woman can't be forced to provide aid for that fetus. Now, we've already talked about this uh, in a way also, where, in fact, I do think that morally and legally, uh, parents have serious responsibilities to use their own bodies to support their own minor dependent children. We force people to pay child support, and in doing so, right, the person doing that uses his own body to work at whatever job they do, construction, and then you know, part of the money that they make is given to yep. uh, the child in need. So I, I think that it is common morality that parents have serious duties to their own children to support them and even to use their own bodies to support mm -hmm. them. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, really good articulation. Thank you for that, Dr. Kazor. That was very helpful. Next one comes from Brendan. Brendan says, 100% pro-life, but one of the things I struggle with is articulating just what a pro-life society would look like. People are, are afraid of totalitarian laws, and I get that. So what do we say to that? Yeah, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. So I think the law should recognize that all people are created equal. And so all human beings are created equal. And so we should protect all human beings in the law and therefore protect the basic rights of all human beings. That would include, obviously, uh, mentally handicapped human beings. It would include babies. It would include prenatal human beings. So all of us have equal basic rights, and that includes the equal basic right to live. And therefore, all of us should have a legal immunity from other people intentionally killing us. Now, a pro-life society, though, is way more than just laws against abortion. We need way more than that. We need a culture in which people that experience crisis pregnancies receive the support they need to move forward in a positive way with their lives. We need a society in which there's greater education about uh, the, uh, the value and the dignity of prenatal human beings. And I'd say that a lot of our society now culturally doesn't promote, for instance, self-sacrifice, doesn't promote caring for the vulnerable, doesn't promote things that we need to promote in order to have a true culture of life. So for me, it's not just about laws. Uh, laws are important. And if we're going to have a just society, we need just laws. And a just legal community defends all of the members of the community, not just some. So we do need pro-life laws, but I think we need a lot more than pro-life laws. We need support for women with crisis pregnancies. We need a culture in which uh, the origins of life are respected. And so there needs to be lots of a change in development. Now, the bottom line, of course, is that we're never going to have a perfect society. But I don't think we should let um, a lack of perfection get in the way of making meaningful mm -hmm. advances towards having a more perfect society. So, for instance, will there be a day when there's absolutely no racism at all? Well, I hope so. But even if that day's you know far off, we can always move towards a more perfect society where people are more people are included, more people are respected. There's fewer violations, uh, moral and legal, of the basic dignity of others. And so that's what a pro-life society looks like. Yeah, that's really good. I, I appreciate that response as well. Here's one from uh, from Brooks. Brooks wants to know, what is the justification for the threshold of parental obligations? For example, let's suppose if someone uh, breastfeeds her hungry child and gets an infection and dies, does she still have those obligations? So yeah. So as I say, I do think that parents do have obligations for their own children. Are there limits to those? Uh, yeah, I think there's limits to those. I mean, if if you said your child is um, sick and the child needs an operation that's going to cost a million dollars, the only way for you to make enough money to have the child uh, get the operation is you have to move to Siberia and work in a coal mine, uh, you know, 14 hours a day for the rest of your life. And that'll be enough money to pay for your child's operation. Like I would say, Yes, we have an obligation to care for our children, but no, do we have to move to Siberia and work 14 hours a day in a coal mine for the rest of our life to make the money for the operation? No. I don't know if there's a real 
uh, I don't think that there's a set threshold that I can give to you and say, well, here's the threshold, you know, uh, 18% of labor, 80% of labor. I don't think there is a threshold, but here's a threshold that I think is operative. No parent under any circumstances should ever intentionally harm their own son or daughter. That is a threshold. And so I should never, even if someone threatens me with death, intentionally harm my own son or daughter. And one of the most grievous harms that we can inflict on anyone is to end their life. If you end someone's life, you take away their chance for a valuable future. You deprive them of all the friendship they would have had, all the play they would have enjoyed, all the things they would have learned, all the love they would have given and received for the rest of their life. So that is a very, very, very serious harm. So I think the question of how much aid to give is much more complex and difficult to say. And I think that depends in part on, on, the, um, on the resources you have. So if someone's very wealthy, right, they, given their resources, can aid their kids a lot more than a very poor person. But whether you're rich or whether you're poor, both of them equally have a responsibility never to intentionally harm their own son or daughter. And I think that is exactly what abortion and infanticide do. Mm-hmm. Both abortion and infanticide intentionally harm a son or daughter. And therefore I think those actions uh, are morally impermissible and also ought to be legally impermissible. Yeah, very helpful response yet again. Let's, let's finish with this one. This is more of a practical question. And this comes from Lucas. Lucas says, I'd like to ask Dr. Kayser, uh where he personally feels the pro-life movement should go next, and what are his thoughts on the 14th Amendment arguments put forward by Ryan Anderson and company? So it's kind of two questions there, if you don't mind. <laughs> Take it off. Yeah, so where should the pro-life movement go next? Um, I think that there needs to be multiple uh, movements forward. So on the legal front, there needs to be move- movements forward, because now that Roe versus Wade is overturned, there are opportunities to Uh, move forward towards uh, more just laws. Now, is it going to be possible to have perfectly just laws? Well, no, I I doubt that's going to be possible, at least in the near term, but we can get more perfect laws. So I am concerned about, uh, you might say, overreach. So it's much better to have a law, for instance, that protects some prenatal human beings than to push for a law that protects all prenatal human beings perfectly And then the law fails to go through and therefore there's no protection at all. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we have to move in an incremental way to try to get as much protections as we can and, you know, continue to strive forward. But as I mentioned earlier, I don't think the law alone is the answer. I think that culture is vitally important. And so all of us have a role to play in that, a role to play in terms of helping women with crisis pregnancies, a role to play in terms of educating others, a role to play in terms of helping uh, families that are struggling. So there's lots of different things that that all of us can do. And we all have a role and we all need to pitch in as much as we can to build up a culture of life. So uh, I guess that in a way, uh, in a way that responds in part to the 14th Amendment sort of question. So for people that aren't uh, up to speed on this, uh, Ryan Anderson, Robert George, John Finnis and others have put forward the idea that the U.S. Constitution itself uh, has protection for prenatal human beings in terms of the 14th Amendment, which says that no individual should be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so abortion arguably does deprive an individual of their life without the due process of law. In other words, if I violate the law, well then, yeah, maybe I can be put in prison for life. But if I don't violate the law and someone just puts me in prison, well, that's a violation of the 14th Amendment. I, having looked over those arguments, I am persuaded that these are good legal arguments. I think I think they work. The best presentation of that is by uh, Robert George and John Finnis. People can Google this. They had a petition to the court in which they went through very careful legal analysis mm-hmm. of the grounds for thinking that the 14th Amendment actually does uh, protect prenatal human life. And so I just would invite people to, you know, read this uh, amicus brief by John Finnis and Robert George, and they can judge for themselves whether they think they think it's legally persuasive. Um, I do, but I can understand why other people don't. 
but anyway, they can they can check that out and judge for themselves. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you for pointing that out for us. So before we say goodbye, Dr. Kayser, please remind us of your book yet again. Uh, tell us where people can can get a copy, and then uh, mention any of any um, all your other work that you think is relevant to this, and, and anything you might be working on in the future. All right. So the the name of the book is called "The Ethics of Abortion: Women's Rights, Human Life, and the Question of Justice," and the third edition is uh, coming out uh, next month. Uh, September 2022. And um, yeah, what other things have I worked on? Well, I wrote a book with the University of Notre Dame Press called uh, Disputes in Bioethics and another one called A Defense of uh, Dignity. And so I've written a number of other books in terms of bioethics. And then I've written some books on uh, the virtues, uh, the cardinal virtues, the theological virtues. And um, yeah, people go to Amazon, they can see if, uh, what I've written. Uh, right now, what am I working on? Well, I just got done with an essay. So I guess I'm not working on it anymore, but I just got done with an essay called uh, Thomas Aquinas on Gratitude to God. And basically in the essay, what I was doing is looking through all the places in the corpus of Thomas where he talks about gratitude to God and then trying to put all these passages into some sort of order to give the reader a sense of uh, Aquinas' views on gratitude to God, you know, as found in all these different places. So so that was kind of a fun essay to work on and write. Um, I also working on slash just finished an essay on uh, lethal organ donation and double effect raising. So lethal organ donation would be getting organs like, say, a heart uh, from someone before the individual dies. So it's a violation of the so-called dead donor rule. Anyway, it's something I'm kind of thinking about a little bit, but um, yeah, those are some of the things I'm working on and thinking about. And um, yeah, and I'm grateful for you for making time uh, for me for this podcast and giving us a chance to talk about this this important issue. Yes, it is hugely important and uh, really extremely grateful for, for your time and the work you're doing. So I'll be sure to link all those resources uh, below so people have access to that. And I want to encourage them to, to go obviously much further. These podcasts can only can only accomplish so much in an hour. The book is truly excellent. Uh, I can't recommend it enough, and I hope people go and pick up the third edition. Dr. Kazor, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you very much.